volume. My business partner is a complete bastard. If I explain, I think you'll understand why. Twenty years ago, just before Joy and I got married, we rented a narrowboat and cruised the canals for two perfect weeks. It was hot for most of the two weeks, and it was idyllic. We had spent nights together and many weekends together before, but this was the first time we were able to have sex morning, noon and night, day after day. Since then, we promised ourselves that someday we would have the same narrow boat, but for many years it seemed just a dream. We raised two wonderful children, but now both are at university and I doubt either of them will return home to live. I own a business software company in partnership with my former friend Paul, he does the sales and I do the writing. I spent most of the first 12 years of my marriage working for a large software company as a software analyst Paul was a salesman for the same company and it was during this period that we became friends. I was making decent money but 10 years ago I began to become disillusioned with my employers mainly because they had sharply reduced retrospective bonus commissions on the sale of standard business packages. Paul wasn't happy either, so we decided to start our own business, but it took almost two years before we decided to do it. I admit, our method was rather unethical, but no one ever succeeds without resorting to a couple of tricks. I smuggled copies of some popular packages out of work, and in my spare time, redesigned the interface so that the data entry screens looked completely different and reformatted all the printed reports, leaving most of the programs untouched. Paul, for his part, continued to sell our employer's product, but whenever a potential buyer doubted the price, Paul would say, On the other hand, I can offer you this, it's just as good, maybe better, and much cheaper. So he brought my customized software into the business premises and created seed capital for us, when we started our business. Our first two years in business were desperately difficult, and we were on the verge of closing. Paul used his car, drove for many miles, and chose cheap boarding houses instead of the hotels he was used to. I wrote programs every free minute I could keep my eyes open, while Joy continued to work full-time, act as a mother, and handle all the correspondence and typing for our new business. The next three years were also hard, but by the end of that period, we were doing well enough that Joy could quit her other job and go full-time on our salary. By this time, we had a portfolio of applications that we could sell off the shelf relatively cheaply, could tailor any of these packages to a specific client's requirements, and could design and program any new system that the client needed to develop. The latter were the lifeblood of the business because the client paid the bulk of the development costs, and we still had one more product for our catalog. The last three years have been a period of consolidation, and we have seen the fruits of our risk. The final sign of success was that a year ago, we hired a girl to replace my wife, allowing Joy to become a lady at her leisure while continuing to earn almost the same income from the business. Lucy, our new assistant, is a sight for tired eyes. If the word nubile didn't exist, it would have to be invented especially for her. She is 22 years old, has a very cute face, long wavy blonde hair, and breasts the size of oranges. She's like a living pinup. I would never dream of cheating on Joy, but just being around Lucy lifted my spirits. One afternoon, as she sat cheekily on the corner of my table, chatting cheerfully and constantly crossing and uncrossing her legs, I found myself in a forbidden arousal so I took my overabundance of lustful thoughts and went for a walk to cool down. On a whim, I took a few steps towards the canal and began to stroll along the muddy water. After a couple of minutes of walking, I saw a narrow boat with a for sale sign. As I got closer, I noticed that the sale would be through a private tender and the current day was the last day for submitting bids. I assumed that I was already late, but curiosity forced me to climb aboard and look around. The boat was dirty and abandoned, but as far as I could tell it was in good working order. As I was about to leave, another man joined me and said he had come to take down an advertisement. He was happy to open up and show me what was below deck, and I was not disappointed with what I saw. When we finished talking I asked if there had been much interest in the boat, to which he replied, not much, but then, perhaps feeling he had been a little imprudent, added that there were already two or three bids. 
The most important information he gave me was that bidding closes at 6 p.m. I returned to the office, frantically doing the math, and decided that I could meet the reserve price, but the boat was worth much more. However, I put in an offer of pound 1,000 over the minimum, added another pound 160 as an add-on, and set off to hand deliver it to the address provided. Two days later, I learned that my bet was successful. At this point, I decided that I would not tell Joy about my purchase. Our 20th anniversary was only three months away, and I planned to spend that time cleaning out the boat and then give it to her as an anniversary surprise. Paul was usually in the office just after lunch on Friday to catch up on the week's paperwork, while Lucy worked a couple of hours on Saturday sorting mail, leaving at 2 p.m. on Fridays. It dawned on me that if Paul was right in the office and could cover for me on Fridays, then I could get some time to work on my new boat. With this intention, I told my partner about the purchase, asked him to help me, but emphasized that I should not even hint to Joy about my gift for her. That night, I mentioned to my wife that I was working on a new app and would be staying in the office on Fridays for a few weeks. She knew I worked better when there were no distractions. As a matter of fact, the boat's poor appearance was mostly superficial, and after just two sessions dedicated to it, I had the cabins sparkling like new needles and the exterior looked at least decent. At this point, with still more than eight weeks until the anniversary, I realized I had time to completely update the look and repaint it. Moreover, I decided to make it an exact replica of that old boat. There were several photographs in the album that I could use as a reference. The original boat was called Joyful. We joked that Joy is totally aboard Joyful. So all I had to do was remove the last three letters and my wife's gift will bear her name. Now I must confess to one ulterior motive. During difficult days, despite being tired, we tried to do something sexual to maintain mutual comfort and contact other than business matters. Now that better times have arrived, you might expect us to make up for lost opportunities but in fact the opposite has happened. Our love lives have become rare instead of frequent. I would like to note that at 38 years old, Joy looks much younger, closer to 30 than 40, and remains a very desirable woman. I'll admit, she has a maturity to her, but she maintains the slender figure that I fell in love with from the very beginning. So I hope that a canal cruise on a replica of that old boat might rekindle our youthful passions. I had done three sessions on the boat, and had begun to touch up the paint when Paul came into the office unexpectedly on Tuesday and said, This Friday is our first barbecue of the year. You and your lovely wife are invited as usual, but if you'd rather work on her project, there's no reason why she can't come alone. I conveyed this invitation to my wife that night. She was delighted, but was surprised that I couldn't take the day off and go with her. I was tempted, but eight hours of painting made me realize that I had taken on too much and would need every spare minute to finish everything on time. So I worked on the boat and Joy went to the barbecue alone. Joey. I went to Paul and Lisa's in a taxi. I now had my own sports car with two seats, but I knew that by the end of the evening there would be a lot of drinking. I was a little upset with Tom for not taking me to the barbecue no matter how urgent his new program was, one evening couldn't hurt. We haven't had any real overtime in the last two years, so I think I was starting to get annoyed at what was once a standard part of life. I also knew that, being alone, I would have to be extra careful to avoid Paul's hands. For years he openly tried to touch me in front of everyone Lisa knew exactly what he was doing and didn't seem to care, but dear Tom never did. I didn't notice anything. It occurred to me that it would be fair if his partner could really feel my body, but I had no intention of giving Paul more freedom. Such outings were a rare pleasure because we never went anywhere or did anything. To tell the truth, I was bored as hell. I was used to a busy life, and since I retired, I didn't like it. One boring day followed another. We finally achieved success, but it only gave us money to spend on things we rarely really needed. All these years of sacrifice and struggle, and for what? It wouldn't be so bad if we still had the joy of intimacy, but it became boring too Tom rarely showed interest, and I had no desire either. Even when things were at their worst, we always had that connection. 
Many times Tom fell asleep while having sex with me. On the canal cruise before the wedding, if Tom had come to me and said, we're going over the threshold and we're going to drown. There's a chance we can save ourselves, but if we stay on the boat, there's time for one last sex. There wouldn't have been any no doubt what we would do. Sex was an integral part of our lives at that time and for many years after, and it was difficult to understand where that old intimacy had gone. Paul greeted me with his usual kiss on both cheeks. Standing by the wardrobe while he removed my cape, we exchanged pleasantries, and he made a big deal of it about how much he missed me in the office. This prompted me to ask how my replacement Lucy was coping, adding, Tom says she's effective but hasn't said much about her. She's a real gem, Paul exclaimed enthusiastically without hesitation. Not only is she good at her job, but she's also pleasing to look at she even makes my pulse beat faster. Tom thinks it's the best invention since sliced bread, and he's totally obsessed with it. I accepted this as a figure of speech and did not attach any importance to it, but Paul seemed embarrassed and awkwardly continued. With irritation in his voice, he said, Even so, I think he might neglect his personal pleasures for one evening so as not to miss our first barbecue of the season. Come on, I said, defending my husband. He has this urgent new application, and you know Tom always puts work first. Paul looked at me with confusion. What new application is this the first I've heard of? Other than tweaking some existing packages, there hasn't been any new software development in the last 18 months. Then why does he stay late at the office every Friday night? I asked. Not only doesn't he stay at the office, but he's been leaving early on Fridays for the last few weeks. Paul answered firmly, and then, covering his face with his hand, added, Oh, crap, I'm talking too much again, after Tom specifically asked me to no one don't talk about it. I know he desperately doesn't want you to find out. What time does he leave the office on Fridays? About two o'clock the same time as Lucy. They live together. I felt cold. Are you saying Tom is cheating on me with Lucy? Tell me, Paul. Yes or no, I want to know, I demanded. Even if that's the case, it's not the end of the world, Paul said, looking at me sympathetically. Both Lisa and I are not entirely faithful to each other, and that's not hurting us in fact, I think it keeps the spark in our marriage. If you don't mind, I think your marriage is stagnant, and that makes me sad, because we are both very attached to you and Tom. Even when business was at its most intense, it was obvious that you and he could not keep away from each other. You had a natural connection, body language, but it seems to have disappeared. Just a little romance can get Tom out of his rut, and you could use a little of that to bring back the sparkle in your eyes. As he spoke, Paul put his arm around me and squeezed my shoulder. I automatically tensed, which made him jump back in a defensive position and raise his hands in protest. Geez, not me. It's not that I didn't want to, but Lisa warned me that you were out of my reach. He looked so comical that I had to laugh. He joined in, and that softened the situation. No, you want a young, energetic guy, Paul continued. By the way, we have one on hand, and he wants to meet you. I followed my host out to the terrace in confusion, unsure whether Paul had confirmed that my husband was cheating with Lucy or had only hinted at it. There was no time to analyze the situation, because the next moment Lisa greeted me joyfully, kissing the air on either side of my head. I was then introduced to Giusep or Joe, as he is known in this country. I took my breath away, as it often does when I see exceptional beauty, because Joe was the most beautiful man I had ever met. He was about 25 years old, of average height and thick build, but not excessively. He had the warmest brown eyes you could imagine, and he was very dark-skinned. His fingers were warm and soft, but not at all feminine, and my hand seemed to fit smoothly into his grip like a glove. The food was ready and waiting for us. While we ate, I could not take my eyes off his full lips and very white, strong teeth, and every time I forced myself to look up, they met the warm lakes of his eyes, fixed on me. We had all been drinking from the start, and the thoughts of Tom's betrayal made me drink two glasses quickly, so that I could already feel the effects of the alcohol. I enjoyed the situation and the company,
but the pleasure was overshadowed by a feeling of tension inside me. I became aware of a pleasant sensation on my neck and realized that Joe had his hand on the back of the love seat and was gently moving his finger just below my ear. It was both soothing and relaxing, and I felt my head begin to move in response to his caresses. Paul and Lisa sat across from us on a similar rocking chair. My eyes must have closed because when I opened them suddenly, I was stunned by what I saw. Paul lifted his wife's skirt up to her hips and caressed her inner thighs as if they were completely alone. The surprising thing was that my friend was not wearing underwear. A few seconds later, I couldn't ignore the fact that I was also feeling the caresses. What I was doing was certainly wrong, but it seemed insignificant compared to what my unfaithful husband was undoubtedly doing at that very moment. We started having sex. As if in a dream, I looked at Paul and Lisa again. They sat separately, watching us without shame. It sounds disgusting, but it wasn't in a weird way, it added to the sexual atmosphere of the situation and made it even better. I didn't mind the spectators, but I was depressed that it happened in front of people, so I started muttering how ashamed and sorry I was. Lisa said not to be upset because it was a rare event and they were privileged to see it. Joe then picked me up and carried me into the bedroom where we had sex again. After that night, I started seeing Joe for a week to go to the motel, and a month later I was with him again at the next barbecue. Volume. Joy didn't say anything special about the barbecue, answering my questions with, you know, it's business as usual. She mentioned that there was another male guest, adding rather sarcastically, so we didn't miss you one bit, and that was the only reproach for not being present. Immediately after that night, her behavior changed, and she began to act more like the girl I married. It seemed that she was subconsciously aware of the boat because of her new behavior, exactly what I hoped to provoke with my gift. In fact, I began to reap the benefits of my enterprise a few weeks earlier. I began to have more and better sex than in many years, and as a result, at work, my infatuation with Lucy's body began to wane. Four weeks and the next barbecue arrived. I was aware of the boat project and was willing to take the evening off if Joy had been more enthusiastic, but her opinion was that I should keep doing what I was doing so far. The following Wednesday afternoon, after I had already eaten lunch, the first cloud appeared on my horizon. Lucy couldn't find the old file and asked me where it might be. I didn't know, so I called home because Joy was doing this before she left. There was no answer. I called again half an hour later and then throughout the day with no answer. That night I asked, where were you this afternoon? Nowhere, I was here the whole time, she said with a strange expression on her face. You couldn't be here, I said and mentioned how many times I called. Joy then said that she was doing laundry. She went on to explain that the phone couldn't be heard when the washing machine was running. There were two loads, and she spent a lot of time hanging out the washing in the garden. This sounded very plausible until she decided to elaborate, adding, and it was so nice in the sun that I took a cup of tea and read a book for an hour. This had to be a lie. It was pleasantly warm over the weekend, but then the temperature dropped sharply and Wednesday was overcast with a chilly wind. I didn't say anything, but it got me thinking. Later in the evening, I quietly looked around the house and found a lot of dirty clothes that still needed to be washed, but no clean clothes ready to be ironed. On Thursday, I called home with the initial question about the file and Joy provided an answer. On Friday, I asked Lucy to call with a fictitious question about the same file, and again my wife was home to answer the call. On Monday, I called but hung up as soon as it was picked up, and on Tuesday, I muted my voice and pretended to dial the wrong number. No one answered the phone Wednesday. After several more calls with the same result, I went home and, making sure that the house was empty and my wife's car was missing, I returned to the office. The hours between then and the end of the workday were the most difficult I have ever experienced. At home, I waited with difficulty until we had eaten before asking casually, where were you this afternoon? Nowhere in particular, why do you ask? She replied with feigned indifference, but I saw her eyes suddenly become wary. I've called a few times with no answer, but I guess you'll say you've been doing a lot of laundry again, 
and hanging out the laundry in the rain. Are you testing me? She asked, looking into my eyes. Do I have a reason for this? I don't know how your mind works. After so many years of marriage, you should have a good idea of how it works I trust infinitely until I have good reason to be suspicious. What are you trying to say? She said, turning away. You are cheating on me? Her face filled with anger. What if I'm cheating? I don't know how you have the nerve to sit there and question me when you've been sleeping with that little bitch Lucy behind my back for months. My wife's accusation stunned me. Although I was completely innocent, her words very effectively put me on the defensive. I didn't touch her when did I have such an opportunity. On Friday nights when you're supposedly working, leaving early with her some days and any other time you want to bend her over the table. Lucy may look like a sex toy, but she has a fiancé called Mike, and they are getting married in September. I admit I didn't work on Fridays, but Paul knows it has nothing to do with Lucy, and he will confirm that. Joy shook her head in disdain. Don't count on old friendships to shield you. If you must know, Paul almost directly told me that you were cheating with Lucy and how you went away with her early on Fridays. He said you were crazy about her until he said, I didn't have the slightest idea. I jumped up, grabbed Joy by the arm, and roughly pulled her to her feet. I'll show you something, I said angrily. During the trip, apart from my simmering hatred of Paul, my anger subsided, and Joy sat silent and depressed. I took my wife to the canal and pointed to the now clean narrowboat, saying, This is what I've been spending my time on Fridays for the last three months. I bought it as an anniversary gift. Joy looked at the boat with her name on it and immediately threw herself on my neck, covering my face with kisses. She was like a child with a new toy, insisting that I show her everything below deck and admiring everything she saw. This was exactly the reaction I was looking forward to, and honestly, during our time on the boat, it seemed like we both forgot the confrontation that caused me to reveal my surprise earlier. However, on the way home, she began to cry quietly next to me. At home, she said, I'm so ashamed because I cheated on you. She then began to tell how Paul first made her doubt me, and then provided an attractive seducer to take advantage of her moment of weakness. Joey. The sex was even better in the bedroom. That first sex on the rocking seat was wonderful, but it was more a fact than an act. I was the one who asked Joe if I could see him again, not the other way around. I would have happily let Joe have sex with me all day, every day, so I was a little disappointed that he could only meet on Wednesdays, but it was understandable because a man like him must be very sought after by wives like me, in fact, by all women. When the time was up, I felt kind of embarrassed to appear naked in front of the other two, so I had to send Joe to look for my dress and panties. Joe dropped me off at the end of the road a little after two o'clock in the afternoon. Tom was asleep in bed. Even if he was awake, I was not afraid that he would want sex, because I assumed that he had already satisfied his desires with Lucy. I took a quick shower and put my dirty clothes in the back of the washing machine instead of the laundry basket, but other than that I made no attempt to hide my activities. In fact, I was looking forward to seeing my husband's face when he found out I was giving him a taste of his own medicine. I wanted Joe, I wanted him desperately. It's strange, but when I couldn't have Joe, I wanted any kind of sex with the same hunger, and it was Tom whom I used to satisfy this need. I thought he had lost interest in the intimate side of our marriage, but all it took was a spark from me to ignite a raging fire within him, and we started having sex again in a way we hadn't done in years. I still loved Tom and enjoyed sex with him just as much as on my honeymoon, but all the time I was counting the hours, minutes, even seconds until the moment when I could be with my lover again. Wednesday became that day. I went to a large suburban supermarket and left my two-seater car in the parking lot. Joe would pick me up there and drive me to a motel, where we would have unlimited, unlimited sex from ten in the morning until four in the afternoon. We never discussed what contraception I could use, and we always had unprotected sex. At first I didn't take any action for years, there was no need for this, since Tom had a vasectomy. So I took a big risk at that first barbecue, 
but the following Monday I started taking the pills again without telling my husband or lover that I had done it. There was another barbecue at the end of the month, which gave me the bonus of two meetings with Joe in one week. It was unpleasant when Tom hinted that he might take a day off and join me, but I managed to subtly dissuade him. Perhaps it would have been better if he had come, because it would have prevented something that has bothered me ever since. The next Wednesday was particularly special, and I returned home in a state of complete bliss only to have Tom ruin everything by asking where I had been. It was like a bucket of cold water was poured on me, all because of a stupid telephone question that let him know that I was not at home. I was able to come up with a weak excuse on the fly, and he believed it. This should have made me more cautious, but I couldn't help but see Joe, and when Tom found out I was out again the following Wednesday, I knew I was in trouble. At that moment, I was less worried about our marriage than about the absolute panic at the thought that Joe wouldn't fuck me anymore. To begin with, I wasn't too upset about Tom sleeping with Lucy and was even glad that I had it as an excuse for my own promiscuous behavior, but when he started accusing me, I immediately counterattacked, showing him that this is not a one-way street. The answer to the answer might have perhaps left us both free to continue dating other people, but when Tom brought me in to prove his innocence by showing me the boat, I was left with no excuses. Seeing his gift, I was so fascinated by the ship that for a while we both seemed to forget about our family problems, but on the way home everything returned to my memory with full force. I was terribly ashamed for taking unjustified revenge, but I honestly couldn't regret my wonderful hours with Joe. When I got home I started a full confession, but after telling me how Paul had made me doubt Tom, my husband's anger shifted from me to Paul, and he didn't want to hear anything more. We had sex, but I think he couldn't understand that Joe had been there before him, because it was brutal, angry sex, but still quite enjoyable. Volume. The next morning I arrived at the office a little early, and, as soon as Lucy arrived, I pressed a twenty-pound note into her hand, saying, I need to talk to Paul alone, so take the morning off. Go shopping, buy yourself something. She looked at me with wide eyes, I think the expression on my face told her that the upcoming meeting with my partner would not be pleasant. I knew he had to be there that day, so when he came in, whistling an annoying tune, I was ready. Jumping up, I grabbed him by the throat and threw him against the wall. I clenched my fist, ready to throw the first blow, but held back because Paul cowered, making no attempt to defend himself, despite. At the fact that he was larger than me, I let him go, stepped back and said contemptuously, You are a damn piece of shit, I wanted to beat you like you deserve, but I don't want to get my hands dirty on you. We're done. You're pathetic. Pack your bags because I'm closing my business. From now on we will stop trading. Paul straightened up, straightened his collar, and said calmly, Don't you think that's a little harsh? What did you expect after you ruined my marriage? I can't work with you anymore, so everything will go to waste. By this time Paul had managed to get between me and the table. So you're going to throw away everything we've sacrificed, all this work, just because another man had a little fun in your private garden that's truly pathetic. You set it all up, I said. This is too much. When Joy got the impression that you were having sex with Lucy, I admit that I did not try to dispel her doubts. Honestly, I don't see how I could say anything without betraying your secret about the boat, but you swore to me not to disclose this. As for the destruction of your marriage, I think it did you good. Now you're talking nonsense, I spat. Is that so? When I first knew you and Joy, you couldn't keep your hands off each other. But that hasn't been the case for a long time, right? Your marriage was dead, or it was. Ever since Joy got a new friend, everything has changed. She's starting to shine again, which hasn't happened in years, and you're definitely getting a lot more than before, so either you really tried your hand at Lucy without me knowing, or your house is having fun in bed again, by the way. You should try your hand at our office worker. His words stunned me because I believed that our newly revitalized sex life was a secret between me and my wife. You don't know what you're talking about. I know everything I know from bitter experience. Listen, Tom, let's call a truce. Make us some tea and I'll tell you something about myself that you don't know. 
Not knowing what else to do, I followed his suggestion and then listened to his story. When I met Lisa, I thought there was no other woman like her in the world. We were a lot like you and Joy, if not more so. One night in bed, shortly before our wedding, she said, I know that people like you and I know that you won't be able to resist temptations. Don't promise that you will stop, because I know that you won't. And that's normal for me, just don't expect me to keep myself until you're not coming home. I thought it was just sex talk to turn me on. So when I found out that Lisa was cheating on me with several guys, I was heartbroken. We discussed everything and decided that since she wanted other men, and I did, want other women, we should abandon the concept of fidelity. Since then, we have adopted the so-called sex lifestyle, and we could not be happier in fact, you and Joy are the only traditional couple in our social circle. Overcoming jealousy can open up a whole new world of freedom and pleasure for both of you. There was no doubt about his sincerity, so I answered seriously. It may work for you, but I'm just not that kind of person. I admit that Lucy flirting around the office ignited my passion, but I really don't want any other woman, except Joy. That may be acceptable in an ideal situation, but is the situation ideal? Joy has shown that she wants at least one other man besides you, he countered reasonably. I'm showing you how to deal with the situation as it is. So what should I do have women I don't want so that my wife can spread her legs for anyone and everyone with a clear conscience? Not necessarily. I told you that we started switching partners with other couples and still do it sometimes, but now we prefer to just invite another man to join us. Sometimes I engage in sex, but more often I just sit and watch Lisa and him together. I looked at my wily partner in disbelief. What can you possibly get out of this? You'd be surprised. Rarely do two people have the same sexual desire, so in any marriage one or the other is bound to be disappointed to some degree. I thought I had a high sexual appetite, but Lisa leaves me behind she has that, what the books call carnal hunger. I call it sex fever, and I suspect that Joy has the same instinct that was dormant, but is now activated. In general, women often want more when a man has already exhausted his strength. Joey. The next day I was on edge. I knew that Tom had left the house with the intention of running into Paul, so I half expected the police to come with the news of the murder. I also knew that I would have to continue my confession and racked my brains how to tell the truth without causing too much pain to my husband. When Tom came home and said that he had a long conversation with Paul and that they had agreed to remain in partnership, I was stunned to know what was said, but because I was clearly guilty, I couldn't ask questions. Tom was surprisingly gentle and understanding, saying almost nothing, only occasionally nodding his head, while I talked about my weekly meetings with his rival. He said he forgives me, and in response I made a very painful gesture. With Tom at my side, I called Joe. Before he could say anything, I quickly said, My husband knows about us, so I can't date you anymore. I'm sorry. Goodbye. As I slowly hung up, I heard Joe say, If you ever change your mind, anytime, anywhere, just leave a message on the answering machine. We had a lot of sex over the next few days. I was aware that I was trying to undo the damage caused by my behavior. For a brief moment, I truly believed that we could put this behind us and get back to the way things were, and then next Wednesday came. I cried all day, or at least tears flowed from my eyes. I ached all over and showed all the symptoms of an addict in deep withdrawal. I knew I had to be with Joe. I felt that I had a right to be with Joe, and I hated my husband for depriving me of this wonderful pleasure. My body decided that if it couldn't have sex with Joe, it didn't want to have sex at all, and each successive Wednesday reinforced that decision. Intellectually, I still loved Tom very much and desperately wanted to atone for my betrayal, but I could not control how my body would react. I didn't say no to Tom, but I couldn't answer him, and I had to do my best not to be completely rigid and push him away so it was a relief when he started to leave me alone. We both had no desire to go out on the boat, and the weeks passed while we coexisted, each in our own zone of misery. Volume. After six weeks, I was in complete despair. Joy and I walked around barely talking, 
and she was just as depressed as I was. Instead of making things better, ending the affair actually ruined my life. While Joe had my wife, I enjoyed the best sex of my life, but since I stopped it, I didn't get any more sex. Joy, of course, didn't refuse me, but it was more like necrophilia than making love, and I soon stopped trying. Perhaps I should have realized the solution much earlier, but better late than never, it came to me suddenly. In the office, during Paul's rare appearances, we were barely polite to each other, but the need to know led me to adopt a friendlier tone and ask, What is this Joe guy like? He's a great guy, Paul responded enthusiastically, relaxing at my initiative. There aren't many like him Joy couldn't think of a better one to start with. I've seen him with Lisa plenty of times, and he's very impressive, she loves him very much, and he's the favorite of most of the wives in our crowd. A lot of studs are arrogant assholes, but that doesn't bother my bitch wife, she's more interested in what's between their legs than their character. In fact, it's the men I despise that turn her on the most. He paused, and then added, Actually, it turns me on too, and it makes me really pathetic. I thought about this conversation most of the evening. Suddenly, I came out of my thoughts and saw Joy looking at me questioningly. Do you want to start seeing Joe again? I heard myself ask myself before I finally decided to say it. My wife looked at me with disbelief and joy on her face. Can I call him? I nodded in agreement, but as she walked past my chair, I grabbed her hand and said, I want to meet him first. Joy didn't say a word, but I knew she agreed with this condition. Then, as she answered the phone, I added, and when that happens, I want to be there. This made her stop and turn around, as if she wanted to say something, but the desire to talk to her lover took over. I went to the kitchen to put the kettle on. There wasn't time for a cup of tea, but I wanted to give her some privacy. When I returned with two mugs, she was sitting in the chair again. Is the Vine restaurant good for you tomorrow night at nine? Joe said he'll make a reservation. As soon as my hands were free, Joy pounced on me, showering me with kisses. This escalated into wild sex on the couch, and then in the bedroom to repeat. The next day, my wife spent more than two hours getting ready, and I also spent a lot of time on my appearance. I couldn't help but think about the paradox of trying so hard to look good to meet my wife's lover. Joe was already there and rose from his seat when we approached. At first glance, I was frozen in shock Joy had mentioned that he was from Italy, but I had never imagined that he could be black. A few steps before the table, Joy freed herself from me and ran towards him. The kiss on the lips was more than polite, but still within the bounds of decency as Joe moved his head away. My wife pressed herself against him for a few more seconds, then pulled back to say, Tom, this is Joe, Joe is my husband Tom. Joe extended his hand with a big smile on his face. His handshake was firm, but the skin felt silky and had a kind of vibration. I should have hated this man, but I immediately felt sympathy for him. You are a very lucky man, I heard him say. During dinner we talked about other things Joe talked about his difficulties being black in Italy, and I talked a little about business. It felt strange to have a civil conversation with the only person other than me who had slept with my wife since we got married and who was about to start again. We got to coffee without discussing the reason for the meeting, so I unexpectedly invited him to our home. Joy looked at me questioningly, but I nodded. When the waiter arrived, I tried to pay the bill, but Joe insisted on doing it himself. As soon as we entered the house, Joy disappeared. I don't know where, but Joe had obviously been waiting for such an opportunity. I love married women, but I don't want to break up marriages, so I prefer to keep it a secret, he said. I do other things, but it's not that easy. Some husbands like to watch because it turns them on, and some participate, but not many. Others think they can handle it, but then realize they can't, so I'm always very careful with newcomers like you. I don't want embarrassment or grief, so if you insist on being present and are not sure of your feelings, I'd better back off now. I'm fine, I assured him, although I already had cramps in my stomach. Joy reappeared, asking, Are you going to make us a drink, honey? I hurried to fulfill the request, but when I turned around with the drinks, 
I was upset to see that they were already sitting on the sofa together. We sat pretending to drink drinks. Joe stood just as rigidly as I did, but Joy leaned against him. It was my wife who made the first move, stroking him. The show started, but there was no easy way forward. In the bedroom they began to undress each other quite naturally, and I sat down on a small chair in front of the dressing table. The sex was both impressive and definitely erotic. It didn't bother me as much as I thought it would, but I was really upset by the obvious affection she had for him. At some point she turned to me and invited me to join if I wanted. I refused. I endured this as long as I could and then announced that I was going to bed for a couple of hours. I lay down in the spare bed, listening to the sounds of their activity for a long time before I fell asleep, but then didn't wake up until the morning. Joe left, and Joy slept in the deep sleep of weariness. I got ready, quickly had breakfast, and went to work. As soon as I got home that evening, Joy ran up to me. Joe said you're lucky, but I'm really lucky, she said between kisses. I don't think any woman in the world has such a wonderful and loving husband. I was given time to take off my jacket, and then she said shyly, I prepared something really special, but if you're not too hungry, I have something even more special for you upstairs. I happily followed her to receive my reward a reward that made it all very worthwhile. The next evening I told her, In the future, you can see Joe alone. If you go to him in the evening, there is no need to rush home if it ruins the mood. Joy took this literally and stayed with him all night from then on, and I didn't see her until the next day. It didn't bother me because I was getting six nights of great sex every week. There were times when the three of us went out for dinner and then returned home, but after some pleasantries I always went to sleep on the boat. Speaking of the narrowboat, Joy and I had a lot of fun with it, and there was one very enjoyable weekend when we took Joe out for a canal cruise. They spent time together below deck while I steered the boat, but at night we all slept in separate cabins. You might think that despite the very unusual situation, I was very, very happy. Joey. When we got home from the restaurant, I felt very uncomfortable. I knew I should have sex with Joe to set the record straight, but it didn't feel right. Once we were in the bedroom, things got better, but it still wasn't. It was easy both times at the barbecue. I could ignore Lisa and Paul, but I was constantly aware that Tom was sitting and watching. I thought it would be better if he joined, so I tried to invite him, but my poor husband clearly didn't want to. I knew Tom didn't like being a spectator one bit, and I half expected him to say he was wrong and that I couldn't see Joe anymore. Instead, he went the other way and let me stay with my lover all night once. A week, Joe and I actually met in the morning as before and got almost 24 hours together. I began to live to the fullest, and Tom seemed surprisingly happy. Joe and I had been dating for a little over six months when he said he couldn't date me anymore. He was being hounded for a paternity test, so he was going to go abroad for at least a year, and when he came back, it wouldn't be to our area. I wasn't heartbroken because, in a sense, the affair had run its course. Sex became mechanical and predictable without that initial spontaneous delight. It was still very good sex, but I came home feeling a little disappointed every time. We parted amicably, without regrets and with gratitude to each other for the pleasure we had given. I told Tom the next evening. With Joe gone, I had planned to make it up to my kind husband for tolerating this deviation in our marriage, but instead of being pleased, he seemed almost upset by my news. He was immersed in his book again and didn't seem to want to talk about it. Volume. Only a psychologist can understand this, but I can't. Although I hated watching Joe have my wife, I took great pleasure in the fact that it was happening out of my sight and at a distance. They say that transcendental meditation can give heightened sensory perception, and I got a similar effect from sitting alone and thinking about what my wife was doing with another man. In my solitude, I didn't drink, read books, or watch TV. While Joy was away, I had a constant nagging feeling in my stomach, but this was offset by other pleasant sensations. Overall, I felt more alive than ever, and these significant benefits tended to last throughout the following week. It seems to me that I looked forward to my wife's meetings with her lover 
even more than she did herself, so it was with a feeling of almost destruction that I heard that it was all over. Joey. We sat there for two hours, at least pretending to read books, without exchanging a single word, when I looked up and saw Tom smiling happily at me. You can always find someone else, he said. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.